Right. Well, with that in mind, let's move into our story, a Christmas story, three weeks uh, reflecting on Christmas, as it were. And this morning, I want to talk about a perfect time, a perfect time uh, here at Christmas, and particularly a perfect time for the introduction of Christ our Savior uh, into this world. You can turn to your Bibles, Galatians chapter 4. We'll just have a couple verses we'll hit there. And while you're turning, another special guest in the room, I just saw him to get a chance to... Dr. Carl Laney. Carl is way in the back. Stand up, Carl, if you would. Dr. Carl Laney was one of my seminary professors in 1985, and he's visiting his daughter who goes to our church uh, right here today. So give it up for Dr. Carl Laney. And all the stuff you don't know about Jesus is his fault, So because uh, he didn't teach me, all right? No. Taught me very well, etc. And uh, great to see you. I look forward to seeing you, Carl, uh, after that. Well, all that's to say is back in Portland when I was in seminary, 1986 as it was, uh, uh, I was there. I'd been in Portland from Phoenix. I'd been there about nine months, and I'd sworn off dating. I had sworn off dating because I was never going to go out with another person unless I was just certain that this would be my wife. Have anybody had that? Anybody sworn off? No, all y'all dating around. Look at you. you know, just Man... But all that's to say, I'd sworn it off. So for nine months, my first nine months in Portland, I didn't date a soul. I was tired of going out with people and, and, you know, and all that, whatever. So I was throwing myself into God, doing my thing. I was at the church I worked at. I was a youth pastor while I was going to seminary. And one day I was walking uh, to the office at the church, the office area of the church I was at. And at the door, at the front door, which you had to buzz in to get into, there was just this most amazing, beautiful girl. Now, Portland, if you've ever been to the Northwest, beautiful at certain times of year, like when the sun's shining all two months of that. No, I'm just kidding, but, you know, but it's so beautiful because it rains so much, right? And so Portland is kind of be really dreary. It can be overcast and spring, the rain and, and all that. And, 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 of course, coming from Phoenix, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, we have four seasons, warm, hot, hotter, and hottest. You know, that's like the... But so I was in Portland, I was all depressed at different times, and I, I mean, it was a real struggle, but I worked through it, I was working as a youth pastor, nine months there, I'm in this church, and uh, it wasn't, you know, block building, cinder block, gray, uh, you know, all, just, I, if I could just count it down, and here was this girl standing at the front door in this bright green coat, all colorful shoes, you know, lipstick on, it was like, it was like otherwise in this otherwise gray, dull, background, here's this thing, you know, woman just popping out of nowhere, right? So naturally, I just went over to the door, you know what I'm saying, and moseyed on over there, and um, I get to the door, open it up, and uh, I say, hey, can I help you? And she goes, I'm here to see the pastor. So uh, anyway, I, so I basically took her to the office, showed her the pastor's door, and I went back to my office and went back to working, and, and, uh, and so I was sitting in my office, and, and, and I was thinking, I go, man, I haven't seen any girl look like that in Portland, Oregon, you know. I'm, but I really didn't, that was it. I didn't really have much to act on. All of a sudden, about 10, 15 minutes later, my phone rang, and it was the pastor of the church. He goes, can you come to my office? Now, at that moment, I, in a sense, I'd got back into to work, and I'd forgotten that this woman had gone into the pastor's office. So when I went into his office, I was like, my, I was instantly surprised again, because there she was in all her glory and beauty sitting right there at the pastor's desk. And, um, and so I sat down, and it turns out that she was going to go be a missionary for a couple of years, work with young people in Germany. And uh, she was in the process of raising support. She'd been uh, working in the church for a couple of years with fourth and fifth graders. And now she wanted to move up into sixth grade, which I oversaw, uh, at least for a few months till she raised support, went overseas to work with kids, right? So that fell into my department. So the pastor introduced me to her, Linda Franks, and, uh, and she introduced me to her. And so quite naturally, I said, well, I need to interview you. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, so uh, I invited her over to my office. We sat down, and, and I learned that she was Greek. And so I started trying to impress her with all this Greek I was learning at seminary. And, but anyway, make a long story short, a week later, I called her out, and the rest is history. We've been, to Mary, we've been together now, uh, let's see, that was 86, so gosh, coming up on 30 years, 29 married or so this next year, crazy, right? And God did that, and in a sense, none of us would be here if it hadn't have been for her, so I was just so thankful that, but I tell you that story, not to get into my personal life and affair, but I just remember how God's timing is perfect, you know? God's timing is perfect, and it always is. So you all say that with me. God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. It always is. It always is perfect, right? And I remember that because I was like, 
again, not looking or anything, but God knew my need, knew what, etc. And in that moment, at the right time, at the perfect time, God introduced Linda into my life. And together, you know, of course, we've been together and all that we've done and been through and experienced through the years came because God knew and met that moment in, uh, met my need in that right moment at that exact moment in time, right? Well, the Bible tells us as well that God sent his son into the world when? At the perfect time, right at the right moment. At the perfect time, he sent his son to us, right? So Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, the apostle Paul writes this, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, he's in a diatribe, as it were, about how the Gentiles are included with the Jews and the gospel, the church, the kingdom of God. And he's speaking, in a sense, almost to Jews in this moment, but, but generally speaking, that God is sent into the world, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles and to redeem the world uh, through Christ. Uh, and this is why he was sent into the world. But notice that phrase, Paul says, but when the fullness of the time came, the fullness of the time. There's a word in Koine Greek, it's chronos, where we get the word chronology from. It just means time. That's all it means, just time, pure and simple, right? But that's not the word that Paul uses here. He uses a different word uh, when he talks about the fullness of the time. And in, when you look it up in the Greek, it talks about this word, uh, this fullness of time is kind of like, uh, one of the metaphors I saw was like a ship that's loaded with all its cargo. So, you know, you can have a ship that's empty and eventually the cargo gets on, then the sailors get on, then all the food gets on, and it's totally loaded up, ready to go for the journey, right? That's part of kind of a metaphor of what this idea, the fullness of time. Another one would be essentially like a woman who's pregnant, right? And, and, and she's conceived and she's gone through the, the nine months and everything, and you're, you're right there ready to deliver everything. There's nothing else but for the baby to come, right? The fullness of time of the time. And that's what Paul says at the fullness of the time in God's grand design of which we get little glimpses here and there. Uh, someday we can ask him, maybe someday he'll explain exactly why at this moment in time he sent his son to the world. But this is the idea that the fullness of time came, the grand design of God. He knew the exact moment, the perfect time, and his time is always perfect, right? To send his son, born of a woman, uh, born into the world, born under the law, so that we might be redeemed. That is, he would redeem both those under the law as well as those who weren't Jews and Gentiles alike, right? So why did he come? Well, as it says here, to redeem the world. But really, when you think about him, uh, Christ being interjected, uh, becoming incarnate, sent from God in the flesh to walk as man, why, why did he come? Well, it says here, of course, to redeem. But think about it in these terms. Remember the angels at the time, they said to the shepherds, glory to God and what? Right, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men, mankind, not just men, right? So think about this. Paul later talks about this in Romans 4, glory and peace. Think about that. This is why Christ came. If you boiled it all down to two words, for glory and peace. First, he came to glorify God, right? Glory to God in the highest. And the idea is, what is glory? It's when I take a flashlight and I shine it on something that you otherwise can't see, right? Christ comes to, we might say, reveal God, right? To have seen Christ was to see God. Not necessarily physically with your eyes you see God, but he is the fullness of the deity made flesh, incarnate, right? So in that sense, he exposes, he turns the light on, he reveals God, the glory of God, we see. But then also it says he sent to um, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, this is the idea of being redeemed or reconciled as individuals to God through faith in Christ, right? He does that. But also, it's peace with me towards all of you, right? And to people in this world. And so what is that? It's love God and what? Love your neighbor, right? So he came not only to reveal who God is, to glorify him, but to establish peace on earth. Peace with me, the individual, with God through faith. Peace with all of us peacemakers. In fact, in Matthew 5, 9, uh, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And what's significant about that is that in every other beatitude, you get something for what you do. Blessed are they that mourn, they get what? Comforted, right? The meek shall what? They get, they inherit the earth. There's only one beatitude where you are said to be like Jesus, to be identified with Jesus. Blessed are those who make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God, identified with the very mission and the life 
of Jesus Christ, right? So he came to glorify his Father in heaven so we could see, get a glimpse of his character, his love, etc., and so that he could bring peace with man to God, with man to man, love God, love your neighbor, and it's as simple as that. This is why he came at the perfect time, and God's timing is always perfect. So in part, again, that's why he came. But we might also ask ourselves the question, why did he come, right? Why did he come at that time? So one is things that why did he come? Glory and peace, right? But it's another say, but why at that time? What made that the perfect time, the fullness of time in God's grand design? And of course, again, we see in a mirror, uh, you know, in a window dimly, a mirror dimly. We don't get it all. We don't fully understand why was it at that exact moment God sent his son. But we get a few, there's a few reasons we can ascertain. So one, for instance, is that uh, they had a language called koine, which basically means common. So in Greek at the time, and there's been four other generations since Koine Greek, or five in total, uh, Greek was number one today, modern Greek is number five. But at that time, and by the time, because of the Greeks, a couple hundred years before that, etc., there was kind of like English today is kind of a common language throughout the world, right? Lots of people try to learn English, speak English. It's not the most spoken uh, language in the world, but it is one that kind of is common to every different uh, group and ethnic group and country, people want to learn English. It becomes, in a sense, a common language for the world. Well, that's exactly what Koine was. So if you have a common language and it's not just tribal, then ideas can spread, right? So there was a common language called Koine, Koine Greek, and that's, of course, the, the language in which the New Testament was written. So that's maybe one reason why God sent him at that time. There had been a common language established at that time in human history that could disseminate these ideas. Another one is because of communication. So you think about the roads in Rome, right? You remember the phrase, all roads lead to what? All roads lead to Rome. In other words, all roads led out from Rome. And the idea of that is because of, of the strong presence of Rome throughout that region, that world at the time established by Augustus Caesar, the strength of the military, etc., their construction, what they did with roads and highways, as it were, the safety of those roads, the strength of the military, etc., it allowed for a lot of free commerce and travel, right, on these roads that all roads led to Rome and therefore all roads led out of Rome, which was kind of like the internet of its time. Not, not the internet, but an internet by foot, right? So just like in the last, we were just talking this morning, Tyler Turchie and I, isn't it amazing? I mean, some of us have lived uh, obviously this long, but I think Facebook was only invented like in 2005, if I remember right, something like that. That's like 10 years old or something, right? And Twitter, you know? I mean, back when we started this church 15 years ago, we had AOL dial-up, and we thought we were something, right? You know, and the slow speeds, and you sit there forever, and, you know, websites, I mean, it's like one page, and we'd just come out of the pager era, you know, like pairing a pager on our smartphones. I think the iPhone, I could be wrong, you can look, I think it came out in 07. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that's how fast, and think how the world has so rapidly changed. It seems like we've had iPhones and smartphones forever, right? I mean, maybe less than 10 years. It's crazy. So and when you think about that in, in human history at a macro level, uh, there's been a couple eras like that. So 500 years or so ago went the printing press, right? That helped to accelerate information and knowledge. Well, at the time of Christ, Roman roads did that, right? And so Roman roads helped to establish and, and to provide for commerce, travel, and with the trade routes and all that stuff and kind of a central location was kind of the hub of the world. So too, through Koine Greek, etc., this word could go out. So a couple reasons from a human standpoint that maybe this was a time, the perfect time that God sent his son to the world. Some conditions were right for that. But, but one, of the, one of the strongest reasons that we might look to and say, why at that time is the fulfillment of a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. You can look it up if you'd like. We won't take the time to read it. But in Daniel chapter 9, there is a prophecy concerning the coming of Messiah, the time that he would come. And without going into all the, the details and reading it through, etc., basically, at the, at the time of Daniel's prophecy, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, he prophesies that, that basically within 69 weeks, and, and again, there's more details to this, I'm giving you kind of the 30,000 foot view, but in 69 weeks, which are interpreted as, as year, periods of years, seven years, so every week was seven years, you do the math, that's 483 years. From 483 years from the time of a decree by Artaxerxes, uh, which you can read about in Nehemiah chapter 2, when this decree goes forth from Artaxerxes 
uh, to uh, essentially to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. From that decree, which is a historical decree, from that period of time, there would be 483 years until the Messiah would be cut off, would come and be cut off, which is a Hebrew idiom for saying essentially rejected and killed. So, there, and people know this. Now, I, I did some reading on this. Uh, some people, I've always thought the date was like in March of 444 BC, and that could be it. Uh, some people place the date of, uh, of Artaxerxes' decree at 457 BC. Uh, maybe Dr. Laney can shed light on that. He's an expert in all this kind of stuff in, in, in the Old Testament and, and uh, times and customs, etc. But the bottom line is, and, and then you've got leap years and 365 day versus 360 day calendars and Jewish. So there's some flex in all of that. But by and large, every Bible scholar that looks into this stuff knows that essentially 483 years went by from the time Artaxerxes declared, made that decree, until, which takes you right up into the week in AD 33 of Christ's death. It's 483 years. And of course, Christ was cut off. The Messiah came and was cut off, that is, rejected and killed at the end of those 483 years. In fact, going on from there, it says in Daniel chapter 9 that the people, uh, in verse 26, of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, meaning Jerusalem and the temple. So this would also be a part of this, this that happens at the end of 483 years. Well, of course, Christ is crucified, most believe, in AD 33. But then by AD 70, Rome, in fact, did sack Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. And from that point on, the Jews as a people were dispersed, which is called the diaspora, right? The diaspora dispersed throughout the world and didn't come together as a nation again until about 1947 at the end of World War II. So for roughly 1,900 years, Jews did not have a nation. And that happened in 70. So in other words, they were, in fact, as Daniel prophesied, uh, the city, the temple, as it were, was destroyed. Their end did come like a flood, meaning a major destruction, verse 26. And again, 70 AD, the Roman temple was destroyed. So 69 weeks did go by, whatever the time you date that at, but it was to the time that Christ came and Messiah was cut off. Well, where's that seventh the 70th week, that last seven-year period, you might ask. Oh, that's for Bible prophecy, right? But that last week that's missing from Daniel's prophecy because he said 70 weeks until the whole thing's done, right? Well, 69 came, Messiah's cut off and died. The 70th week, that last period of seven years, you know what that's called? The Great Tribulation. So the tribulation is the one week that's missing now, the seven years that is yet to be fulfilled. And what many people believe is that at the time of Christ and when he was rejected by the Jews, so to speak, cut off, killed, this began what many people call the age of the Gentiles, right? So Paul got after it, as we know, in preaching to the Gentiles and creating what we call multi-ethnic churches today. The gospel went to the Jews and from the Jews to the world through Christ and Paul and the church and the Gentiles. And it's almost like this parentheses was entered into, right? So you had 69 weeks, Messiah cut off, and then a parentheses. So the parenthesis starts with the cutting off of Messiah. When does it end? Oh, well, we don't know, right? We don't know. Some people say it's going to end, and that's the rapture, right? That's the pre-tribulation rapture. We'll put a close to this parenthesis, and seven years of tribulation will start. Some say we'll enter into those seven years, and the rapture will come at the end of those seven years, post-tribulation rapture. But at the end of the day, we're living in this age of the Gentiles, and, uh, and boy, aren't we glad we did, because if all that happened the way Daniel said, just the Jews would be saved, right? So God has perfect timing, and his timing is always perfect. So these are some of the reasons, and particularly fulfillment of prophecy, that Christ was sent to the world by his Father at the time he did. Now, I probably got your mind working a little bit on end time stuff. How many has got your mind working right now on end time stuff, all right? So let me take a quick aside uh, on this, because many people, as you know, Perhaps yourself see the events of today in the Middle East, uh, Russia flying into Syria, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, all these things many people, many Christians see as a sign of the end of times, right? Of the coming tribulation of Armageddon, of even the second coming of Christ, that we are very possibly living in the last days, right? In the end times. And, I, and frankly, personally, I don't doubt that we are. I really don't doubt that we are. Uh, but a day is like a thousand to the Lord. It could be another 200 years before all this happens. It could be another 20 minutes. I don't know, right? But I do think we're living in what could be called the birth pangs, like a woman who gets pregnant. In a sense, my personal belief is the clock started ticking in 1947 or so with the, when the Jews were regathered, 
right, as a nation given back their land. The Ezekiel's prophecy of the dry bones began to happen. So for me personally, as I've thought about it, studied, I'm not saying I'm God's gift of truth or anything. I'm just saying, but I do feel like that's when, in a sense, the pregnancy started, right? Like a woman gets pregnant, and then it takes time, and eventually you deliver. I kind of think the pregnancy, the moment of conception for the end times, in my personal opinion, was around 1947 again. So I think this, now we're in that pregnancy period, right? I don't know when the baby's going to be born, so to speak. You know, when, when Christ comes back, tribulation, the rapture, I don't know all those things. But I do, in fact, believe we're in those end times, as it were. And, and so if you, if you embrace that, if you kind of feel like I do, that, that somehow, even though we don't know the time, it could be two years, 20 years, 200 years, but somehow we're in that last season the Bible describes as the end times. If you kind of buy into that uh, and, and think about it like that, then, then it begs the question, so what do we do? You know? So like, what should you do if these are the end times? I mean, should you stockpile food and money? Like, you think that's what you should do? Stockpile food and money? Do you uh, think about guns and ammunition? Is that what you know? Load yourself up with guns and ammunition, you know? Uh, maybe head for the hills. I don't know. Worry, doubt, fear. And when I was a kid, I was like, oh, God, please don't come before I get married. I used to pray that prayer, you know? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm the only guy who was praying that way, you know? I used to think, okay, how can I get away from this? I'm going to get a scuba gear, and I'm going to go into the ocean, or I'm going to move to, you know, to the Iceland or something. I don't know. So how do you respond if you, in fact, kind of feel that we're in the end times, if you kind of believe that? Well, Jesus told us how to respond. Did you know that? Part of him coming to the earth told us how. It's in Matthew 24. And he talks about, you're going to see wars and rumors of war. Don't worry. Don't panic. It's the beginning of birth pangs. Again, that pregnancy analogy, right? But at the end of the day, when you study Matthew 24 uh, in there, Jesus basically says, don't be afraid. Be ready. Don't worry about it. All the worrying you can do isn't going to change one thing. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to live one moment longer than God's ordained for you to live. You're not going to change the course of history because of your worry, your doubts, and fears about the end times. Jesus said, don't worry, be happy. No, just kidding. Don't worry. I had to say that, right? Don't worry, he said, be ready. Be ready, right? That's what he tells us. In fact, he gives an analogy in Matthew 24 as well. He talks about the ten virgins. Five virgins, and they had oil lamps. So it's like candles. Think about candles, but it was like in a little clay pot, little lamp. And, to, and for the light to work, you had to have oil in your little lamp, right? So he talks about the ten virgins. Five had the oil. They had saved for that moment when the bridegroom, so they're all ready. When the bridegroom comes, we got our oil, we got our, you know, we got our light. And five, they didn't have it. And so sure enough, the bridegroom comes when they're not expecting. All the ones without are like, give us some of your oil. And no way, man. If I give you my oil, I don't have any. So they go, go away, and the bridegroom comes while they're searching for oil, you're right? And, and Jesus called, he, he uses the words, at least in the English and New American Standard, it's the difference between foolish people and prudent people, right? So being ready in the end times, being ready for Christ's return, of course, this is a season we celebrate his first coming, but he's coming again. Amen. And the idea is to be ready, to have, have the oil in your lamp, to be prudent, proactive, as it were, thinking about how am I positioning myself so that I am proactive and ready. If, in fact, he comes, whether it's a rapture, preacher, whatever happens, I'm ready. I'm not fearful. I'm just ready, right? Live every moment in a prudent way and in a ready position, as it were. And he talks about that. So, you know, of course, again, each Christmas, we recall and celebrate his birth, the incarnation of Christ, that is, God made man and dwelt among us. It's also a perfect time then for us to ask ourselves, are we ready for his second coming? Not just in reflection on his first coming, it's also a good time to say, are we ready for his second coming? Are we prepared, as it were, to see him face to face? Whether that means I drop dead today, God forbid, but it could happen, I have no idea, right? Am I ready to see him face to face? If the rapture happens pre-trib and he comes back and the parentheses close just like that, am I ready? If we roll right into a tribulation period, am I ready? Because that's what Jesus said to be. So it's a good time at Christmas when we reflect on his first coming to also consider, are we ready for his second coming, right? And the next time he comes, of course, he's not coming as a baby. You know that, right? He's not coming as a suffering servant. He's coming as a king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. You know what I'm saying? The king of kings and the Lord of lords, right? So with this in mind, when you reflect on these end times and positioning yourself or preparing yourself in a prudent way, and we ask ourselves, are we ready? If Christ is born again into the world, which he won't be as a baby, but if he comes again, are we ready? 
Uh, what, what, what kind of questions? How do we position ourselves? How do we prepare ourselves for that moment? Here's three questions. You can write these down. First, you can ask yourself this. Is the light of God in your heart? Is the light of God in your heart? You know, there's a lot of people who doubt his existence. There's a lot of confusion and fear and all kinds of things about just who Christ was uh, in this world. But those of us who have put our trust in him, those of us who have believed on him for salvation, we recognize that we're sinful. Uh, every one of us has sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We recognize that God demonstrated his love towards us because even though we were his enemies, we were sinful and alienated from a perfect God. He sent his son. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? He's given us the chance. Uh, he says in Romans, Paul said, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. You can't work for a free gift. You can't pay for a free gift. Otherwise, it's what? Not free. God gives us a free gift through Jesus Christ. Eternal life, man. You get to live forever, right? We don't die. Sure, we die physically, but not eternally we don't die. We get transformed in the twinkling of our eyes. So the first thing we should do to prepare ourselves is make sure, do you know for sure that God forbid if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know that? Can you look me in the eye and go, absolutely I know. Amen. Not because of the money in my pocket, the color of my skin, et cetera, et cetera. It's because of Jesus. Because I believe, can you say that? Do you know that for sure today? That's the first step in being ready, right? Here's the second thing. Another question, you say not only is the light, does the light of God shine in your heart, uh, but does the light of God shine from your heart to others? Amen. In other words, how are you helping others to come to know him as you do? How are you expressing that light? How are you being a shining light, a city set on a hill, right? What types of good works, as it were, are people seeing in your life? How attractive are you to the gospel, to Jesus Christ? How does the light shine through you? We should work on that as individuals, as a church. Let our light so shine, Matthew 5, 16, that they see our good works and they glorify, they, we, it reflects on who he is. They glorify our Father in heaven. So first is the light in your heart. Secondly, is the light shining from your heart, uh, helping others to come to know him as you do. And lastly then, is the light enough for your heart? Oh, I want you to think about that one. Is the light enough for your heart? One thing to say, the light's in my heart. Another to say, I'm, hey, I'm getting the light out there and shining, but is it enough for you? You know what I'm thinking about there? I'm thinking that in this world, there's an old phrase, somebody I heard a long time ago, maybe you did too. It's like the things of this world will someday pass, but only the things done for God will last. You know what I'm saying? There's something like that. And here's the deal. All of us in life are chasing two things, success and significance. Security, you could say. Security, success, significance. Those are like three S words that we're all chasing, right? Security, success, and significance. But all of those are nothing apart from Christ. In this world, everyone is searching for identity. Did you know that? They talk about their sexual identity. They talk about their political identity. They talk about all kinds of identities in this world. But likewise, all of those will one day fade. The only identity that, that lasts forever, that is a foundation for your life, is an identity in Christ. When you know who he is, you know who you are because of who he is, and you're chasing after a life that represents him. And when you do that, see, that's a success that, that never goes away. I could, be, I could be like, I mean, think about Obama. He's a president now. In what, a year or so, he won't be president. If, if Barack Obama's significance and his sense of self-worth and success is all about his office as president, he's in for a world of hurts. After, because that doesn't, I'm the pastor of this church right now. Every pastor is an interim pastor. Did you know that? We're all com coming through and going on, you know? See, if my success is I'm the pastor. See, hear that word, I am the pastor. My identity is the pastor, right? If that's my identity, if that's my significance, my success, my self-worth is wrapped up in somehow my position or the money I make or, or on the converse, the money I don't make and somehow I don't feel good about. You see what I'm saying? None of that stuff lasts. So when we ask this third question, not only is the light in your heart, is the light shining from your heart, but is the light enough for your heart? Because when you have Jesus, you have everything. And, and, and even think about Ecuador, man. I went to these, this village, and these kids and these people are so happy. You've, you've probably been there. Some of you have been on mission. You go to places that have nothing. They're so happy. You come here, and man, we got all these, uh, what, the, uh, what is it called? The first, the first world problems. 
you know? Oh, man, like my wife, Linda, her car, she hit a deer, you know, and we waited like four weeks on that car. We had to shuffle around and take each other. And every now and then we're like, man, when's your car? And we'd all go, time out, man. That's a, you know, that's a first world problem. I've been to Haiti. Seriously, I've been to the mountains of Haiti. You lose a truck, like, you, you, like a tire falls off and you don't have any more tires, and it sits up on a mountain, it's done. It will be stripped and everything's gone overnight. There is no other car. There's no money for it. I've seen that. I've been there, right? We have all these, these first world problems that we live with, right? All that's to say is that can Jesus be enough? Is Jesus enough to satisfy your hunger for self-worth, your hunger for significance, your hunger for success? None of that stuff's wrong if it's rooted in Christ. I want to be successful. I want to be significant. I want to feel good about myself. But it can't be in any other thing except the foundation that is my identity in Christ. Is Christ enough for you? Chasing the riches of this world, is it about money for you? How many houses you can build? How many cars you own? What country club you belong to? You see what I'm saying? Big deal. It all fades away. It all goes away. Because then someday you get cancer and you aren't at the country club anymore, man. You're on life support. That happens. I watched my uncle go through that. He used to be a big country club guy. Then he got cancer, boom. He's nothing. He's, done. He's dead now. See what I'm saying? It didn't matter. So we chase all these things things of this world and just like that boom they can disappear you got to chase jesus and let him be enough for you now having said all that to wait on god's perfect timing on anything in life whether we're waiting for a second return we're waiting for a building across the street as we have been for 10 years whether you're waiting on other things personal in your life you know waiting on a spouse to be revealed waiting on graduation and college whatever it is Always waiting requires patience and persistence, right? And built into the wait is this word hope, right? To wait on God in his perfect timing is to hope in him. So capture that word. And hope, according to Paul, is strengthened along the journey of the wait, right? So in other words, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 4. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Hear that word peace? Remember, peace on earth, good will of man. Justified, we have peace with God. And then he goes on to say this, we also exult in the hope of the glory of God. There's that word hope, that he'll one day reveal himself and everything will be made right. So we have this hope, he says in Romans 4. Verse 3 says this, and not only this, but we must also remember in the meantime, as we wait on God, as we wait on God and we put our hope, he says this, uh, as we wait, in the meantime, we exult in our tribulations. We don't panic. We don't worry. We know it's a part of the process. Tribulation, challenge, obstacles, right? Because when you persevere through that, it proves your character. It proves you don't quit. You keep going. In the midst of the, of, the, of the challenges, the tribulations, the obstacles, you don't quit because you know where God's taking you. You're on that path. You keep the blinders on. And he says, when you persevere, you find character. When you find character, you find the kind of hope. He says in verse, hope, uh, verse 4, the kind of hope in God that does not disappoint. There's all kinds of hope. I mean, I could hope one of y'all give me a BMW for Pastor's Appreciation Day. Man, I see some pastor friends of mine. They got their anniversaries. They got their car. You know, I'm driving my mom's 1996 Honda Accord out there. Sounds like there's a rubber band running that thing. But hey, man, thank God I don't have a car payment. I don't have insurance. You see what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't, want, I don't want your fancy car. I just want no payments. I'm excited about that. But you see, I, was, I can hope in all kinds of things, but those kinds of hope disappoint. Maybe it's unrealistic. It doesn't happen. But when I hope in God and yeah. he says, here's what I'm going to do for you. Yeah. Here's where I'm taking you. Yeah. And I stay the course through perseverance trial, tribulation, obstacle, challenge, I do not give up, it proves my character. It strengthens, it makes me who I am. And when you get to the end, see, hope doesn't disappoint. Hope comes through. That kind of hope comes through, and it will not disappoint. He says it doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Hear it? At the right time. God's timing is perfect. It what? It always is. It always is. So when I think about all this, of course, this church, Mosaic, knows something about waiting and hoping, doesn't it? We know something about waiting and hoping. Because it's not just about us individuals, it's our collective group, our church, right? 
It's about persevering. This church knows of what it means to persevere, right? It knows what it means to march through trial and tribulation and obstacle, overcome them and every challenge, building character over an extended period of time. Don't we know what that's like now as a church? We know that. And having now God come through for us, having a hope and seeing hope not disappoint, right? You know, it's been 10 years, if you're just visiting with us, 10 years since this church put its hope in God, not because we were thinking, we just thought this is what God is doing, and we began to believe that God would give us a permanent home for, an ex- for extended ministry long past my time in this community, making a difference for God, bright light in the public square. It's been 10 years since September of 2015, uh, of 05, that this church began to put its hope in God and to pray across the street for a permanent home in the heart of the university district, right? In the meantime, as we mentioned, we have persevered, haven't we? Those that are still here and standing, have we not persevered? Have we not come through times of tribulation and difficulty and challenge and obstacle and personal pain and personal hurt? Have we not? It took Israel 40 years to go what many believe should have been an 11 days journey. It's taken us 10 years to go three blocks up the street. And we've experienced all the same hardships and the loss and the pain. You reflect on that sometime because we have. God's given us the ability, a very modern day type, and very few churches get to experience what we did to walk in the shoes of Israel so long ago, right? But through it all, we've strengthened our collective character. We found and forged our DNA. We've come to know who we are and why as a church. We've recognized what is God's unique mission for us, for our church, Mosaic. And we've done all that we can to stay true to our calling as we waited and hoped. To walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called, to walk in the light, to let the light so shine from our collective heart, and above all less, to let that light be enough for us. Not a fancy building, not nice carpet. You see what I'm saying? Let the light be enough. So four Sundays from today then, after 10 years on that journey, and 12 and a half years in this space, in this building, And having preached, as I am this morning, for my very last time in this space, in this environment, can I get an amen? Amen. Hope will not disappoint. God is going to come through. God will bring us home. You know, I think about his perfect timing in regard to a building. Any sooner, we weren't ready. We weren't ready. We weren't as mature as we needed to be. We didn't have enough staff that we needed. We just weren't ready. As much as I wished, I look back, I go, we weren't ready. Any longer, I think we'd all be dead. You know what I'm saying? I don't think, like, I don't think we could go much longer with duct tape on the floors and all the stuff we put up with in this place. Any, God's timing is perfect. It always is, right? It always is. And when he does then reward, when he does choose to act, As he has in the past, he will do so for his own glory, not for our own. When we cross that street, it's not for our glory. It's for his, right? right. And we're going to do our best, as we always have here across the street, we're always going to do our best to rightly give him praise, to let him be glorified. How do we do that? By continuing to extend on his behalf peace on earth, goodwill towards all men and women. You always say all Ecclesiastes 3 1 says this there is an appointed time for everything and there is a time for every event under heaven he has made everything appropriate in his time so in this season we celebrate the birth of our savior jesus christ born at the perfect time in the fullness of time god's gift to us for our salvation for the light of men but in this year too how special it is after all these years of waiting and all these years of hoping that we get to celebrate even more of his goodness four Sundays from now when God gives to us a permanent home from which we'll continue to let our light so shine that they'll see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. His timing is perfect. It always is. And Lord, if we would all signed up for this journey over the last 10 years, we wouldn't have signed up if we knew what it would take. But Lord, standing on the backside, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I thank you for the individuals in this church, the collective heart of this church, that knows it's not about a building, it's about being the body of Christ. Whether it's in this location or the one you've given to us, 
I know that we know that. We've grown to know that. And we're thankful that we have a chance in the weeks to come and in the years to come to, to take our light to a different level, to shine your light at a different level. Uh, and Lord, we just pray you would just make us a beacon of hope. Continue, build, make us stronger as we grow into adulthood as a church. Uh, Lord, a stronger light and passionate for you, for every man and woman in 72204. And as far as the range of our voice and our collective vision would carry us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right now, as